Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Foothill or the shelter? Can you guys give us a wave so that we know that you're you're being that we're being heard? Uh, shelter, are you there? Shelter, shelter is not there. Yeah. There we go. Hey, so exciting. And then uh, 102. Are you guys there? Can I get a wave? Person walking in. Wave. No waving. No, they can't hear us. <laughs> Are they are they on? Uh, they could have us on mute right now. I don't know. You don't know. We're on mute right now. So we're on mute. We're on my end. We're on mute. I need some indication from Calgary 102 that they are uh, hearing us. Is there any way to get that? No. Which 10-10 right? Yeah. Well, 102 going, yeah. No, I think it's 10-10, I don't know. There's too many, there's too many numbers. Yeah, it's 102. It is, yeah. Yeah. Anything? Yep. All right, good. So uh, we're going to start this morning in just a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, this is very cool. Uh, the Mustard Seed is opening up a promo store for all employees, and that is going to launch tomorrow, uh, March 16th. Um, everyone will receive an email with a link to the store where you can go online and order some Mustard Seed swag for personal wear. Roseanne has some samples in the communications office in Calgary if you're interested in seeing some sizing and quality. And I'll bring some samples back um, on Monday for the Edmonton staff to view on Tuesday. Um, next week's speaker is Steve, and he's going to be spending some time talking about the board meeting that's happening on Friday, as well as our strategic plan and budget. Um, please do attempt to make this a priority in your life and uh, be here for that, because there's important information for each of us, and also be prepared to be here till uh, 1045 or so that morning. And I think that is it, um, unless I'm missing something, we're all good. Uh, I think we're all good. All right. And um, today, your speaker is me, um, Dean. And people are still walking in here in Edmonton, so it's good. <laughs> when I started this, there was like two people in the room. So I was like, well, my staff has no interest in hearing what I have to say. It was a little hurtful. OK. Um, three um, things have made me um, contextualize suffering in a new way. And um, one doesn't want to always think about suffering, but I have been forced to think about suffering in um, in a new way for uh, for three reasons. And the first is uh, working here and understanding what suffering looks like for the people we serve. Um, the second is I am taking a class and about to uh, end the class on suffering and hope. It's as exciting as it sounds. And the last thing is a, a period of personal suffering that my family and I have recently gone through. Now. Uh, suffering for our participants can be very obvious. Uh, the struggle to live in relative poverty, uh, the debilitating mental illness, the consuming addictions, the poverty of relationship, the people that we serve suffer. And we see it on their faces, and more importantly for me is I see it in their eyes. And uh, we know that they struggle, and they struggle daily. Yet we are here, according to our slogan, to grow hope, to build community, and to support change. We're not only here to be a place of warmth and comfort for those who suffer, but we're supposed to be a place of hope and transformation. So how do we do that? When uh, we read a lot of the stuff Jesus said, sometimes we don't totally understand the context in which he's saying it. So one of my favorite things that he um, would do uh, was he would contrast the kingdom of God to the kingdom of Caesar. So when um, Caesar was around, and we had, they had Caesars back then, Caesar was seen as a, as a demigod or a human god or a small god. And so they would talk all the time about this being the kingdom of Caesar, which is the kingdom of a god. And so that was the cultural or the cultural context that Jesus was uh, entering into. And so they would talk about the kingdom of Caesar is like, and they would describe what the kingdom of Caesar was like. And it was a place that was for the wealthy, it was for the strong, it was for the important, it was for the successful, it was for the educated, it was for the person on the inside. And so 
Jesus comes along and he says, the kingdom of God is actually like, and he would use all these other words. And he would say that the kingdom of God is actually for the person that's on the outside. The kingdom of God isn't for the strong, but it's for the broken. The kingdom of God is for the sick, not for the healthy. The kingdom of God is for the poor, not for the rich. The kingdom of God is for the person that's vulnerable, not for the person who is successful. And so Jesus, to use my kid's language, throws some very heavy shade on the kingdom of Caesar uh, in, 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 in a very indirect way. Um, to put it more succinctly, N.T. Wright says, if Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. And so when Jesus talks about who he is, he is also saying that Caesar is not something. We live in a world today um, that doesn't describe itself as kingdom, but has many kingdoms. And those kingdoms aren't for the people that we serve at the mustard seed. The kingdoms that exist today are the same way. They are for the successful, they're for the insider, they're for the rich, they're for the person who um, has done well in life, they're for the person that is successful in however it is determined that success is measured. Yet we at the mustard seed aren't interested in that kingdom. We're interested in the kingdom of God. And when we read what Jesus had to say about the kingdom of God, he says that the kingdom of God is a bunch of other things. One of those things that he says in Matthew 13, 44, is he says that the kingdom of God is like a hidden treasure. Um, this is the exact verse. The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when someone finds a treasure hidden in a field and buries it again. A person like that is happy and goes sells everything in order to buy that field. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. Do we see the possibilities of those who suffer when they come into our doors? When someone enters into the mustard seed and the work that we do here, do we see all that they can contribute, all that they can give? Do we see the hidden treasures in their life, their talents, their skills, and their gifts? The kingdom of God sees value in those who are without a role in the kingdom of Caesar. And part of helping that person who suffers is to help them recognize that they have something to contribute. Uh, back when I was still a pastor, I was um, a young pastor at the time, probably I must have been one or two years into the, into the whole thing. And we had a church of about 1,200, and there was this one lady who I found um, um, particularly annoying. And so I, uh, I just you know, would take wide circles around her whenever she was coming my way. And uh, she... Uh, uh, it was immature, you know, <laughs> and so, and uh, and so it, it, it. I mean, she 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 was who she was, and and uh, and so one day um, we hired this other guy um, as, and and he had twenty plus years on me, and and he uh, he was a much better human being than me, and so he suddenly had this annoying lady um, with him in whatever it is he did, and. I said to him one day, I'm like, hey, dude, like I said, I don't know how you're doing that, but like, good for you. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm taking like wide circles and you're just like, and he said, looked at me and he said, uh, yeah, you don't see her for who she is, do you? And all she has to offer. And I'm like, I, I, I tell me more. And so he would explain all the hidden treasures in her life. About two years later, three years later after that, I, um, I, I, I preached a sermon, doesn't matter what it was on, because I don't remember it, so clearly it wasn't very good. And, but she came up to me, and she says to me, um, I want you to know that what you talked about, that that other pastor has been that in my life. And I said, how so? She said, well, she said, I attended this church for about a year, and I was about to leave because um, I know I'm different, and I know not everyone wanted to be around me. And she said, and I was starting to relationally suffer a lot because of that. She said, but he brought me in. And he made me feel useful. And he gave me a purpose. Um, I didn't tell her that I found her annoying because that would have been bad. But like, I, 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 I listened to that and I went, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do at the mustard seed is we need to look at the people who come into our midst and see them for their talents and their skills and their gifts. The person suffering often is unaware of their worth. 
and they're limited in what um, they can provide the kingdom of Caesar, but they're limitless in what they can provide the kingdom of God. And here at the seed, we see the person who has little and we affirm them. And that small act of affirmation in who they are tells the person suffering that their pain doesn't need to find them, that they have hope. The second thing is that Jesus says is that the kingdom of heaven is, or the kingdom of God is like leaven. Um, this is Matthew 13, verse 33. Uh, the worst bread I ever made, and we had a bread maker for a little while. We stopped using it uh, because uh, I didn't like to use it anymore. But I remember once I, 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 had the, I had the dough and I had all the stuff and the eggs and whatever, and I mixed it all up and I, and I put it in the bread maker. And then I remembered that I forgot to put the yeast in. Yeah. So I put the yeast, again, I was young, um, in afterwards and kind of tried to like poke it into the thing, right? You know what, you know what I mean? So uh, the bread sucked and uh, <laughs> it became a rock ornament in our garden. And uh, it was the worst bread ever. Um, if you've ever had bread without yeast, uh, it's dry, it's edible, um, but really bad for dipping into sauce. Like it just doesn't, it just isn't, it isn't what you'd want. And um, yeast makes bread awesome. Yeast is what makes bread grow and become something bigger than itself. Um, yeast, in many respects, is, is what takes something that is dough-like and makes something into um, something beautiful and nurturing and nourishing. Um, Parker Palmer, in his uh, brilliant book, um, talks about, uh, my, Let My Life Speak is the name of the book, talks about friends who one time sat with him. He went through a massive depression. We're talking months and for a while there, he didn't even leave his room. And he had these friends that would come and they would rub his feet um, nearly every day. They wouldn't talk to him because they had nothing to say. They would just sit with him and rub his feet. Reminds me of the foot cleaning we do at the mustard seed, or at the neighbor center, mustard seed's neighbor center, of someone who would just sit with someone and clean their feet, that would rub their feet. That's yeast for the soul. That's yeast for the soul. When we plant dignity into the lives of someone who feels no worth, we plant yeast in the soul. And we see people rise. When our most vulnerable rise, it's not just the vulnerable that rises up, it's the whole community that rises. This is yeast. And the kingdom of God says to the person who is worthless, you are worthy, you are loved, you belong and they rise. We are to see beyond the hollowed eyes and into a soul yearning for the yeast of the spirit to make it grow. We're to help people rise. The kingdom of God invests in the outsider so that the whole social fabric of the community changes. And when our people walk in and they're looking to rise, do we give them the spirit of God so they rise? The third thing that Jesus says um, in Matthew 13, and um, this is obviously our verse, is that the mustard or the kingdom of God is like the mustard seed. And we know um, that mustard seeds here kind of tend to grow into small little shrubs, but in the Middle East, they can actually grow into very, very large trees. And so I want you to think about that large tree, not necessarily that little shrub. Um, where yeast is probably, in my opinion, about the whole, um, the mustard seed is really about the individual person. Now, when I think of the mustard seed, um, the seed, not us, um, I should probably think of the work we do here. However, lately, um, when I think of the mustard seed or a mustard seed, I actually think of my daughter. And um, she's told me it's okay to talk about this. So. Uh, uh, if my voice gets a little shaky, um, please stay with me. Um, anyways, so a few weeks after I started at the seed, uh, we entered into parenting hell. Now, um, rock bottom for us was um, likely the night that we had to take uh, my then 15-year-old, now 16-year-old, to the hospital because her mind and emotions were so broken that she was unsafe to be anywhere else. Um, the kingdoms Maya was a part of oppressed her. Uh, they shamed her. Uh, she felt worthless. The cyberbullying she went through was horrific, and it left her absolutely shattered. 
we did everything we knew to do. Um, we talked to doctors. We pulled her from her school mid-semester. We went to the school administration uh, who uh, refused to deal with the problem to the point where the superintendent had a meeting with us to apologize for the behavior of the administration. So, I mean, if you just contextualize that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the people that you go to to protect your kid didn't even do that. Um, we went to counselors and uh, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. There is no worse feeling in the world than walking into your daughter's bedroom two to three times a night to check on her, being completely afraid of what you might see. But yet we had hope. And on her rare days, her rare good days, Maya had hope too. Eventually, Maya was given a correct diagnosis for a mental health issue. Uh, the cyberbullying flamed in her mental health problem that had been dormant otherwise, and probably would have remained dormant otherwise, but because of this, it, it, just, it just gave it life. And so we, uh, we had to deal with that, and we are dealing with it. She found an amazing counselor eventually. But we also had church. And Maya couldn't be alone for two months. Um, we just could not leave her alone under any circumstances. Um, and she had no school to go to. And so, because we had pulled her out at the beginning of December from the school she was in, and the next semester didn't start with till, till like January 31st. So between exams and Christmas break, there's just, there's no point going to the new school. So uh, we, uh, we had it like two months there where we didn't have anywhere for her to go. Um, so Sasha and I both work, so this is a problem. I'm in a new job, uh, you know, and so what, what do we do? So Maya ended up spending four days, um, all of her days, I should say, with four family friends that go to our church. And she would rotate between these women and their little, little kids. And these ladies um, would spend all day with her until we got home from work. And these ladies were transformational in her life. They supported change. They were her community. And they grew hope in my girl. If you ever wonder what kind of place you work for, Imagine that you are uh, maybe five, six weeks into a job and you call your boss and say, I don't know if I can come in tomorrow. Um, my kid is crashing. Uh, that's not an easy phone call to make. You're in there six months, six years, a little easier. You know, um, you're still on probation and you're wondering <laughs> <laughs> what's that going to look like at the end of it all. And um, Steve uh, was amazing during that time. Um, if you wonder if you're working in a compassionate place, you are. Um, I was so happy for that stretch of time uh, to not be a pastor. And if you ever wonder what it's like being a pastor, um, let, me, let me just describe to you why it is you need to love your pastor. Um, I had no capacity to care for anybody at that point in my life. I was fortunate in that because I wasn't pastoring anymore, I didn't have to worry about that. But your pastor may have to do two things at the same time. Care for crisis in his home and care for a congregation that is going to him or her with crisis. Um, love, love, love your pastors. Um, they, need, they need your support and love. She arrived um, that second semester at a new school, um, which was and remained safe. She ended up being invited to Young Life and through it became part of a small group and as a group of friends who understand her and accept her. Uh, she now loves God and trusts him. She has bad days, but the days are now just days. They're not months. Um, she is growing. Maya was the smallest of seeds. She was a little mustard seed that we weren't sure what was going to happen to her. But now her faith is blossoming. Her life is taking form. And like the scriptures say, that tiny seed has grown larger than we thought possible even a year ago. The kingdoms that Maya was a part of broke her. But the kingdom of God healed her and always gave us hope. Normally, I wouldn't let my 16-year-old uh, daughter get a tattoo. But on November 25th, we let Maya get a tattoo. Um, the tattoo was, in Roman numerals, the date November 25th, 2015, with a semicolon. 
Uh, people with semicolon tattoos are a movement dedicated to presenting hope and to those who are struggling with depression, suicide, addiction, self-injury. Um, the semicolon tattoo is to encourage, love, and inspire. So why a semicolon? A semicolon is used when an author could have chosen to end their sentence, but chose not to. The author is you. The sentence is your life. Without my get a tattoo. Are we the kingdom of God for those who suffer? Here at the mustard seed. Are we the kingdom of God for those who suffer at the mustard seed? We are to be the places where those on the fringes of life find a place of hope, belonging, and dignity. We are the yeast, and we're to bring the yeast. We are to see the hidden treasures. We are to see people as mustard seeds that can grow into something beautiful. We are in the semicolon business. We are in the semicolon business. We support change. We build hope. And we grow community. Uh, Henry Nouwen, the brilliant author in The Return of the Prodigal, wrote this. God rejoices not because the problems of the world have been solved, but because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children who is lost has been found. What I'm called to is to enter into that joy. It is God's joy. Not the joy that the world offers. It is the joy that comes from seeing a child walk home amid the destruction, devastation, and anguish of the world. Um, will we be the kingdom of God for those who suffer? Uh, let's pray. And I want to read to the scripture that defines not just the kingdom of God, but the ultimate kingdom that will eventually um get rid of all other kingdoms. And this is Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the first earth that disappeared, and so had the sea. Then I saw the new Jerusalem, that holy city, coming down from God in heaven. It was like a bride dressed in a wedding gown and ready to meet her husband. I heard a loud sh voice shout from the throne, God's home is now with his people. He will live with them, and they will be on his own. Yes, God will make his home among his people. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. Then the one sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. Uh, Father, we thank you that you are making everything new. And although the kingdom that's so beautifully described in Revelation 21 um, isn't complete, we understand that we are to mirror that in our best way possible in our work here at the Mustard Seed. And so may we reflect um, a place that is like your kingdom in all that we do. May we be um, like all of those things that Jesus describes in Matthew 13. May we see the value in people even if they don't see the value in themselves. May we see the potential in people even when they don't see the potential in themselves. May we provide the spirit of God and allow the spirit of God to be yeast in the souls of individuals, even when they think that they are worthless. And may those that are suffering who enter into um, our midst that you trust us with, um, may we provide them hope, um, hope for a better life, um, hope for a future, um, hope even um, in the ability to know you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Oh.